now for something completely different. Um, I've been asked to, ch to chair a session uh, with, with a very specific question. Uh, the question is, can we create assets with the incentives that value long-term sustainable development and that finances critical global public goods? Can we create assets with incentives that value long-term sustainable development, assets with incentives that finance uh, critical global public goods? So I think I, I'd just like to start with a disclaimer, a confession I made to, um, to Francisco and, and, and Joe Marie la last evening about the background paper. The background paper, I have to do it because I don't want Sagasti to do it. Uh, my paper is full of, of original and sound ideas. The only problem is that the original ideas are not sound and the sound ideas are not original. Um, so the question is, uh, it's a little bit, I make the disclaimer a little bit like uh, Jim Haley this morning on his, on his sober second thoughts on the paper. Anyway, how do we uh, communicate these sound and original ideas? I didn't want to speak uh, for five minutes. So I thought that uh, we would do a cooperative exercise and I try and get across a couple of points uh, with uh, a quiz and a handout. So first of all, on all the tables, I believe there's either a box or a, a dish with toothpicks in it and the toothpicks are not to keep your eyes open. Uh, can, can people find their toothpicks? Okay, uh, now some cooperative efforts required uh, here, and I, I'm hopeful that we can do this because this is a lot easier than some of the cooperation that's required down the road. We need six toothpicks per person, and in case any of them are broken, the six toothpicks should all be uh, the same size. Now, we're going to hand out a sheet. It's a two-sided sheet, and I would like to know, uh, I, I, I encourage you not to turn over the sheet because on one side, are the questions, and I don't want any cheating. Okay, no cheating. No, don't turn the page until uh, I suggest it to you. So rather than me speak to you for, for three or four minutes, you can all read much more rapidly uh, than I can talk. So please distribute six toothpicks to each person. Do not Turn the page over. And then I'd like you to, uh, when you finally get to the bottom of the page, uh, you'll see what the purpose of the toothpicks are. This is a group with an extraordinarily high IQ, uh, so we'll be giving you one minute for uh, these seven questions and the appropriate reading. Anybody besides uh, Paul Martin solve this uh, puzzle three at the bottom of the page? You can see why he was prime minister then. We're still working on that? The triangles, the four triangles are to be congruent and equilateral.
This is very depressing. This is anyway. Let's uh, let's turn the page. Check out the answers. The toothpick puzzle. The point is that uh, very much like uh, like the premise of the paper is we have to think laterally, so you have to think in three dimensions. So a pyramid uh, is is the answer. So my basic point was, look, in this paper, uh, it's time we recognized a, a dead end. That's the purpose of the cartoon. Uh, recognize a dead end. There's no chance of a binding deal, despite all of the institutions and interests uh, that persist in trying to negotiate one. And there's absolutely no chance that, uh, quote, new and additional, end quote, uh, resources are going to be forthcoming at anywhere near the scale that's been pledged. Uh, and the point of the Kissinger story is that if money were available, then an effective expenditure plan could be devised. And at the same time, if there were an accord on an expenditure plan, then the lateral thinking that the quiz tries to highlight, lateral thinking would resolve the means of financing, that uh, the premise is that we have to change the rules. So the paper basically uh, argues that if we had a very rich aunt, uh, assume the aunt gives us a bequest, how could we spend the money and could we mobilize a powerful enough set of constituencies to justify and support uh, thinking that might arise from, uh, or solutions that might arise from lateral thinking. So the only other thing I want to say before I turn to, uh, to our panelists is uh, to remember the, uh, the the question's on page uh, 83 that uh, that conclude the background paper. And without, uh, without further ado, I think I'd like to turn to uh, Francisco Sagasti first. And I think what I, the, rather than uh, go through all four panelists, I'd like to take three comments, uh, the three first comments, not questions, but comments on what Sagasti has to say. And then we'll turn to the second panelist and try and get a little bit more uh, inter interaction and, and iterative discussion uh, that way. So we'll, we'll start with Sagasti first. Francisco. Well, thanks very much. I was expecting to be the well, last one, one. One other thing. I, I'm, I'm very undisciplined and uh, I'm known for not accepting the rules. Since we have four panelists, Francisco, you have six minutes, not five. <laughs> Okay, well, let me very uh, quickly say that I found, I, want, I would like to comment on the paper. I found it a very, very good paper. Clear and uh, most important, it very clearly and accurately reflects the state of affairs regarding the discussions, both in thinking and practice, about the provision and financing of global public goods, and especially climate financing. What does it mean? It means to say that this is a bipolar paper. It's alternating between being depressive and manic. <laughs> and uh, you know, let me just give you some instances of why I find this, and by the way, it's not Barry's fault. I mean, this is the state of the field. Depressive, he says, it's improbable to reach an agreement on long-term financing for climate change, and he just told us this is a dead end. Second, burden sharing in climate change financing is impossible. It won't happen. And uh, therefore, you know, with all of those things, he tells us, no, think out of the box. But let's look at the other side. Let's look at the manic side, and even escapist, and even delusional, I would say, for those who are working in this field. You know, bribe the major countries. You can have your uh, cake and eat it too. This is a no-loser initiative and there will be a free lunch for major countries. If that's not slightly delusional and manic, I don't think what it is. And therefore, as a result of that, he tells us, go beyond the conventional inbox solution. And he tells us, the more radical an option is, is it is likely to be more acceptable. Anyway, frankly, this is the state of the discussion in this area. And I think that the paper, by putting those two extremes, it does a very, very good service to us, and then gets more serious, and it gets to the real part uh, of the, the uh, you know, real meat of the discussion. 
The first real issue that he puts us after going us to this manic depressive cycle in the bipolar part of the paper is that you need to focus. That the whole idea of talking about raising funds, raising funds, raising funds without discussing what is it that you're going to do with them, how are you going to use them, and who is going to make the decisions is getting nowhere. And it's really getting nowhere. And the second thing that he said, uh, very, very clearly quoting some of the other authors <coughs> in this field, is that tweaking the choice space to nudge actors from individuals to corporations and governments, I would say, you know, you can do that in order to make them behave in the right way. I think that after those two extremes, this is the way to go. You need to know exactly what is it that you're going to do with regards to global public goods or international public goods, as I prefer to call them, to deal with regional all the way up. And also, you need to specify, you know, apart from what you're going to do, how is it that you're going to get the money that you raise? What is it that you're going to do with it? And in order to move forward, and here I will sort of rely on some of the work we did a decade ago with Keith Besanson on this subject, building on the pioneering work that Inge did 15 years ago in global public goods. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing is you have to separate the issues. And here you have to be both manic and depressive, you have to be paradoxical, you have to be schizophrenic, because you have to deal with those issues in an integrated manner, but differentiate them and you have to deal, be able to deal with the two. The first thing that you have to deal with is that there are different groups of countries that have very different interests and no single solution will apply to them. It has to go to be an integral solution by highly differentiated. The second and most important thing, which is an example of the first, is that separate clearly between mitigation and adaptation of climate change. They are two very different animals. And by the way, mitigation war is primarily the rich countries, the major countries. Adaptation war is countries like mine. And why do I say that? Because let's leave mitigation, which we have dealt quite a lot with. Let's talk about adaptation. When we looked in detail at what adaptation to climate change what meant, and what were the investments required, there was no difference between a standard development project and an adaptation project. The only difference is that you added one additional criteria, which is climate change impact, carbon emissions, and so on. But you already have in most developing countries an institutional apparatus to filter, evaluate investment projects. You don't need to do any more than that and add an additional criteria and stop thinking about financing a climate change adaptation, frankly. Finance development with a climate change angle, a climate change edge. And one important exception to that, and it really worries me and is very, very crucial, is the whole question of disaster relief because we are going to see a huge amount of disasters both north and south, and we are going to need special mechanisms for that. As long as we're going to have other occasions to intervene, let me just stop by saying that what is needed, and I will tell you the answer yet, is a more practical, more down-to-earth approach in order to deal with the issues of the provision and financing of international public goods, and in particular with climate change related public goods, but not the only one. And I'll come back to that later on. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm remiss in not having uh, introduced uh, Francisco, despite the fact that he's, uh, his bio, brief bio is in, in, in the booklet, but I have to say that uh, I always think of him as, uh, as the complete scholar, uh, sort of uh, the most convincing and uh, evangelical motivator uh, that I've come across. Uh, I'm, I would like to uh, take three comments, not questions, but three comments on what Francisco had to say if, uh, from the tables, if there, if there are any. Are there any comments on Francisco's intervention? Everybody's convinced, Francisco. No, you're going to have a turn to tables. Okay. Wan Hyuk Lim. Uh, Wan Yuk, for those of you who don't know him, is uh, from Korea, is, uh, is the big picture guy who's very, very comfortable with all the broad canvases, but he's got complete command of the most uh, 
granular detail in, uh, in a multiplicity of sectors. Wan Hyuk, six minutes. Uh, I like the paper, but I think it gives, gives up too easily on some of the other options. So I think it's important to uh, focus on the SDRs as you do in the paper, but there are other options that have to be complementary. And, um, and for climate change financing uh, with other you know, financing matters, I think it's important to think about what would be a credible signal for regime change, uh, which would crowd in private investment. And the best known example of that is the Marshall Plan, uh, as far as I know. Uh, if you go, uh, think about the Marshall Plan, the amount of money, public money involved, was about 1% of the GDP of the uh, receiving countries in Western Europe. But it had a huge impact on, uh, on, uh, on a, a reconstruction of Europe because it signaled the uh, US, uh, US commitment uh, to the reconstruction of Europe and attracted private investment accordingly. And I think it's important to think about what would be such a credible signal for climate financing. I think uh, the best thing to do is to put a price on carbon. Now, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, reservations about carbon tax and tariff, but I think the way to think about this is um, as follows. Cap and trade would be very complicated and it could be uh, subject to manipulation. It could uh, involve some uh, financial issues as well. So I, I would propose instead that uh, carbon tax and carbon tariff would have to be the central element of uh, pricing externalities. And suppose if, uh, you know, suppose if a major economy adopts carbon tax and then uh, adopts carbon tariff, uh, you know, using the natural treatment argument, and applies this carbon tariff uh, on non-discriminatory uh, basis for you know, most favored nation treatment argument as well, then you have uh, some kind of signal to the private sector that things are changing. Uh, United States could do this, or China could do this, or any other country could do this. So by having some kind of pricing mechanism for externalities, you change expectations for the private sector and that could crowd in private investment. I think that that has to be the most central part of the uh, equation. And when, when it gets to the SDRs, uh, people like George Soros and as, uh, as uh, Jose Antonio Ocampo mentioned yesterday, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn and the uh, IMF staff and so on, uh, talked about this idea of using SDRs. And overall, I think it's a good idea. And, uh, there's some difference between uh, some of these uh, positions in that Soros, for instance, wants to use the existing allocation of the SDRs as opposed to new and additional uh, issuing of uh, SDRs, which uh, Barry seems to be advocating. But at the end of the day, I think the basic mechanism is quite straightforward. You uh, try and use SDRs as uh, free lunch or whatever, as a reserve capital for uh, the public funding element of uh, climate financing, and using that reserve capital, you, is, you can issue green bonds and finance uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation projects. And as, uh, as Francisco just mentioned, adaptation is more like a development project, so there has to be some element of subsidy involved. Uh, but for m mitigation, I think there's uh, a lot more commercial viability. So uh, using X SDRs as a sort of seed money, I think we can uh, generate a lot of uh, progress on climate financing. Uh, that's it for it. Oh, thank you. Um, any comments on Wan Hyuk's uh, intervention? We take table six. Okay. Um, hi, yeah, Dr. Lim, I don't understand your assertion that adaptation is more linked to government funding and mitigation more to private sector funding. I just don't, why? Give her one minute. Well, uh, countries affected by adaptation challenges are more likely to be like uh, island nations, 
Of course, you can argue that you know last week's Hurricane Sandy was a you know climate change event, and United States has to do adaptation just as uh, as much as Pacific Islands. But what I'm what I'm saying is that for many climate change adaptation projects, uh, you are involving uh, mostly poor countries uh, who do not have resources of their own. So there has to be some subsidy element involved in there. John Williamson. Table nine. I think it's a mistake to uh, uh, argue that uh, SDRs offer free lunch. Um, the SDRs have to be serviced, and therefore they have to be, uh, there has to be something uh, to uh, service them with. Somebody has to pay, and if you uh, uh, use them, in fact, as Barry is suggesting, then there has to be a uh, uh, the, the investments uh, in these countries aren't, in fact, a free lunch. They have to pay uh, an interest rate which will cover the SDR, collectively at least. It may be the scope for redistributing within, but uh, they, otherwise the SDR doesn't work. Um, my, my view is that the problem with the SDR is that nobody wants to hold them, and the answer to that is to raise the interest rate. And that just magnifies the problem of uh, raising the revenue in order to service them. I'll take one third comment if there is one or question. No, in that case, we'll, uh, we'll move on. To Barry, could you? Could you? Oh, okay. Barry, could you read the question that you started with again, please? You want me to read the question that I started, started with? Yeah. Can we create assets with incentives that value long-term sustainable development and that finance critical global public goods? I read it twice. I thought, yes, didn't I? Know. I? No, Were you not paying attention, Cole? I knew you would have something to say about this. Is, uh, I think Wanyuk was attempting to answer it in the vein that he did. I would just say that if you think about financing sustainable development as involving investment in energy, and if you think about the fact that the trajectory over the next 40 years is to essentially double the sources of energy that we have today, you're talking about massive investment. So I think the answer to that question in part, in a very significant way, hinges on the discussion we had in the second session today, which is you need financial regulatory reform to provide incentives for long-term as opposed to short-term speculative investment. And, you know, how that works is a detailed and difficult question, but I think that has to be part of the answer to your question. Okay, thank you. We're going to move to uh, our third panelist, uh, Inga Call who's responsible for, uh, for so much of the research analysis uh, on global public goods, uh, uh, the financing of global public goods. I think of her as the, the, the mother of the area. Um, Inga. Yeah, and I'm not depressed. Because uh, the reason why um, I see a lot of movement is the following. Global public goods most of them, including climate change uh, and um, energy security, financial stability, emerge from a summation process. Corrective action inputs have to be produced at the local level, at the national level. So when, uh, and of course, these national level actions have to be undertaken in a concerted manner, co coordinated, cooperative, or whatever. Uh, uh, and if I look at the uh, national level, I see a lot of movement. I see that uh, countries have introduced taxes. Uh, there are experiments going on with uh, cap and trade uh, schemes. There are uh, uh, R&D efforts uh, being undertaken. You, you make a survey of national level action, and it's really a very active brimming uh, field. But of course, it is not enough if we want to meet in time the two degree uh, goal. But why are we not doing enough? First of all, of course, uh, the global public goods, like any other public goods, are subject to free riding that happens. 
Then, uh, in addition, there is, in my view, a big, big fairness question that we uh, sort of cannot overlook, because still we have the question, you know, how come we are in this situation? Who has overextended themselves into the global public domain and overburdened uh, the atmosphere? So we have to address the fairness question and look for win-win. <laughs> Um, uh, bargains, as you rightly say, uh, uh, Barry. There is lack of capacity. Sometimes we need development assistance uh, in order for countries to do, even to live up to international commitments. And uh, uh, there are lack of resource problems and so. But then there are also uh, uh, countries that make promises and urge us and then don't deliver themselves, you know. Look at, uh, 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 we have crowded a lot of uh, climate change related issues into the ODA envelope, which we meant for helping countries to do their national development, put a development floor into their countries. Now 33% of ODA flow into the global public uh, uh, goods domain. And then there are other countries who block because they simply are oblivious or pretend to uh, ignore uh, the problem. So what can we do? Let me start with the letter group, with those who block and ignore. Now, I think, the whole afternoon I thought it, in the, in the morning, the time has come that you finance guys vacate the G20 forum. You had it long enough, and you have the, uh, you have the IMF, you, ha you have the BIS, you have the Financial Stability Forum, move into this forum, because we have no proper forum to discuss climate change issues. And uh, uh, I must say, if we don't get this issue handled properly, <laughs> the world, uh, uh, John, there is an environmental cliff, it, uh, you know, it, we will feel it uh, soon, and it will destroy the developmental opportunities for generations to come so that some rich people may suffer from the financial crisis, you know, and uh, unfortunately the, the poor all, always also suffer. But I think the climate change issue is such an important issue that we either create a new leadership body like the environment ministers, the energy ministers, that we have something like an environmental security council at the ministerial level, if you want to keep the G20 for yourself. Uh, um, but we need real leadership in this area. Why? Because we should do to uh, this spewing of uh, 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 pollution across borders the same thing that we do to lax financial regulators to sending toxic financial pro products into the world. We have to name and shame them. We have to remind them. We have to report. We have to uh, uh, have peer reviews and everything. So uh, I think we first need to explore these opportunities. In addition, uh, many of the products uh, that are being traded these days uh, have a very high carbon content. So we actually, I mean, this is a market uh, transmitted externality in this case. So why not just ignore them, turn somewhere else? We, so we should set up a little competition. But, and that is how you also can crowd in private finance. You know, let's buy the green products, make green fashionable. Yeah, I will now uh, quickly move on. Now, uh, but what do we do with the development problems and with the capacity uh, uh, problems? I think the, the most important thing is uh, immediately not to let loose on all the commitments we have made already. We have to reinforce our development commitments because without a proper developmental floor in developing countries, you can never cooperate on climate change or any other uh, global uh, issue. So let's pull all the resources together. Let's encourage countries to do things more right nationally. Then, Barry, I want to enter into a beauty competition very briefly because I have a favorite resource mobilization uh, uh, idea and that is uh, the currency transaction levy. Uh, all the uh, uh, financial transaction taxes that exist at present do not include currency transaction taxes. 
And if you approach currency transaction taxes in such a way that you say, this tax is not for purposes of bank bashing, but, yeah, I, my time is up, it is a user fee for more stable, sustained globalization. And then we only would uh, go to the, uh, um, uh, to the uh, 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 markets for currency transactions, like uh, in London or elsewhere, to ask banks to, uh, and uh, the clearinghouses to collect this modest fee, but then to pass it on so that all of you who are somehow involved in the current exchange, uh, currency exchange would also contribute this money. Now, this may be, um, yeah, I end. This may be uh, um, also a very difficult <coughs> proposition, but I would suggest that we compare the political feasibility and desirability with your proposal and then uh, systematically develop both, probably. Any comments uh, from the tables on, uh, on Inga's proposition? Everybody's convinced. Okay, well, uh, among his other skills, I'd like to introduce... Uh, is there one comment here? Is there? Amar? Amar, did you have a comment? Uh, well, I didn't want to, to suggest that what she said didn't have some resonance, but I, uh, uh, so let me just tie the three comments a little bit and uh, ask, you know, as you said, you asked for comments rather than questions. Um, the point that uh, Francisco made is that most of the climate agenda is embodied in development projects. That's the essence of what I got out of him. What uh, Wang Yu said is that a way to finance this that is most efficient is carbon taxation. But carbon taxation doesn't deal with the distributional issue. Uh, the, the poor in India cannot pay the carbon tax that you could impose in Korea or the US. So it's not sufficient to just have carbon taxation without looking at the distributional issue. And what Inge was saying is basically that you can, you, you know, you can find additional ways of mobilizing money. So the question I had is, given the scale of what money is needed, do you think, we assume we are not going to get it from the traditional means, do you think your means will produce that sufficiency of scale? And my view, probably you won't. So what I think you need to do is use the limited amount of pure grant money that you have to leverage up other kinds of financing so that you can fund the kind of development projects on scale that you want. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay, Lawrence McDonald, uh, I think of uh, Lawrence basically as a grandmaster uh, magician. He can transform our research material into co uh, coherent product. Uh, thanks very much, Barry, and thank you, Rohit and Barry, for the invitation. I want to also thank Jim Balsley for his vision and generosity in creating CGD, uh, CG, I should say. It's my third time here, and I always learn a lot and uh, meet fascinating people. Uh, I think that CG can play an important role in addressing the problem that we're discussing today but perhaps not in the way that um, you may be thinking, and I'm going to come to that at the end of my uh, six minutes. Uh, a lot of the discussion that we have heard today has focused on the what, you know, what should be done. Um, I'm interested in the what, and I'm going to address that, but I'm also very much interested in the how, and so I'm going to use most of my time to address that intersection of uh, policy and politics uh, and that's an area in which I think that CG can perhaps play a role. Uh, concerning the what, uh, I like the paper very much, Barry. I think you were far too modest in uh, describing its contributions. And in particular, uh, among the things that I liked was the first section that states so clearly that the current uh, climate negotiation process, the UNFCCC, is broken. I think that uh, this community has an important role in conveying that message because those who are involved in those discussions, they have a really nice cottage industry, they'll keep on doing it and our leaders will keep on uh, pretending that what has happened at these discussions is useful and is progress and I think we need to rise up and say no. 
It's really not. It's broken and then that creates the opening for something new. Uh, the other thing that I liked a lot about the paper was the overview of the various finance uh, mechanisms. Uh, to respond, Barry, to uh, your final question, is the idea of SDR reform and a green super fund the worst solution except for all of the others? Um, I think that's the wrong question to ask because I think that what I took away from the paper really was an all of the above kind of solution to borrow a phrase that has been used in my own country to apply in a terrible way to energy, but I think that we're going to need all the finance mechanisms that we can uh, mobilize and at different groups of countries, different groups of individuals and players will push for different kinds of solutions. So I wouldn't frame it as either or. Um, to answer your other questions, and I won't read them out, people can see them there, but you know, can the idea be framed as win-win? Does it make sense to try and use the SDRs? I would say yes, yes, yes. There are people here who know a lot more about SDRs than I do, but I think in defense of the free lunch uh, idea you had said earlier in private conversation that the point is to have a lunch that looks free in which those who pay the costs are diffuse and perhaps distracted and ill-informed about the costs and I think that that the SDRs if there was ever anything where people are very unclear about who's paying the costs is probably the SDRs. Um, I'll come very quickly to uh, the how. Do I, how am I doing on my time? I meant to time myself. Okay. Um, we have an inflection point now with the election in the United States and as some of you who are either from or follow the US closely will know the environmental movement there is gearing up now to make a big push for Obama to uh, tackle climate issues in a much more aggressive way. The climate movement sat on its hands throughout the election. Uh, maybe that was the right choice, but uh, there's going to be a big push now. Uh, I would like to see a similar international push for the U.S. to take action. And I think it's only with an international push that we're going to be able to um, unlock the terrible situation that my country has found itself in where money calls the tune and that money includes especially the richest corporations in the world which happen to be oil corporations and the coal corporations. And uh, in fact, the Arab oil company, Aramco, can pump money into U.S. politics with no restrictions and as a result we had an entire election in which climate was never once mentioned as a campaign issue. It's an obscene situation. Uh, how are we going to overcome that money? We will overcome that money, I think, by splitting the U.S. business lobby. We had a coalition of U.S. corporations that were pushing for cap and trade. When that failed, that coalition fell apart. They have since been silent and they have let the uh, fossil fuel companies call the tune. Uh, I think that you could split that coalition by having a serious movement to begin to explore the possibility of um, applying carbon taxes to U.S. exports. And I think that that could be justified on the grounds that the U.S. has the highest per capita carbon emissions of any country in the world and it has made no movement at all towards the carbon taxes. I agree with one Hoke that we're going to need carbon taxes. And if there, you wouldn't need to have the taxes, you would just need a serious effort, exploration of that possibility to split the coalition and then get some businesses on the side of action in the United States. There are other things that can be done, a whole set of carrots and sticks. My colleagues at Center for Global Development, uh, Arvind Subramanian and Ditya Matu, are going to be releasing a book called Green Print, in which they set out another set of, carbon, of, of uh, carrots and sticks. They're more interested in the carrots. Uh, I think one possible carrot for rich world action, U.S. action, could be in the new Green Climate Fund. Uh, Seoul, as you know, I should say Songdong, South Korea, is now the host. Um, I understand that the United States said we don't want this to be a pledging like the Bretton Woods. Uh, I don't think that that should be taken as a veto. I think that Brazil and China and India who are going to be hit very hard by this and have substantial reserves should say we do want it to be highly capitalized and we're each going to put in several billion dollars and then let Obama take that back to the Congress and say in fact we do kind of need to join this club because the boat's going to leave without us to, to mix those metaphors if you'll excuse me. Final word, I think that CG can play a role in this by organizing a conference in the next six months, commissioning some papers as to what combinations of carrots and sticks can cause the Obama administration to act and change the political economy of this issue in the United States, but you need to act quickly. We've got four years and then you may not get an administration that's as interested in acting next time. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, this is stimulating. Any comments from the floor? Before I go to a second round, so I have uh, table nine. 
I, I, I may have, uh, have missed something, but um, when, when I listened to, uh, to Larry McDonald, I uh, heard him arguing that the, uh, the important thing was not uh, whether lunch was free or not, but uh, whether it was seen to be free. Uh, <coughs> I also uh, heard him argue that uh, uh, one could apply various uh, carrots and, and sticks in, in, in what was essentially a, a a very ad hoc uh, manner, but to get the result uh, that, that, that one wanted. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, what is it that is special about the climate as compared to our policy vis-a-vis -vis just about everything else, but including financial regulation, which we discussed this morning, where there were many references for, to the need for policy to be principles-based, to be transparent, uh, all, all these usual uh, good, 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 good words uh, that, that all of a sudden we're, we're prepared to uh, accept uh, what, whatever is, is, is on offer. I'll, I'll go around. Yeah. Any other comments? Answer. Um, I think, you know, the big difference is with climate, we really do have a cliff. Uh, the effects that we're seeing now are just, the, the effects that are already locked into the system, as you all know, are much bigger than the effects we have seen so far. There's a sense of urgency. Um, I really responded to what you said, Inga, about the, the finance people occupying the G20. The G20 would work great as a forum for discussing all of the major emitters are there, but I do think that the discussions, fair enough, this conference has been about five years after the fall. It's a financial conference. But there is an extent, a, a sense in which the think tank, the energies and efforts of the most brilliant people in the think tank world are disproportionately focused on financial issues just as the financial sector drew so many of the best and brightest people into making these complex products that nobody could understand. And it would be great to see some of the finance piece pushed aside so we could sometimes think about other issues besides the financial regulatory issues. They're crit critically important, but uh, frankly, they'll be around in 15 or 20 years. The opportunity to deal with climate will have passed. Inga, do you remember uh, what you wanted to intervene on before? I, I, didn't, I didn't let you have the floor. So I said I'd come back to you on something Francisco said. Or it's gone? OK. Francisco. Well, if, with the second round, I'd like to move on what can be done in a practical way and is being done. First, on adaptation, as you pointed out, Amar, there is no great difference between investing for, in energy calling or in infrastructure, in agriculture, and so on and so forth that takes into account climate change. So the point is, is can we devise some mechanisms to cover the incremental cost? That's what GEF uh, did in the end. So we need equivalent of GEF for this particular case of broaden, but the scale of funding is much larger. But the main point is, is a question of project evaluation, project appraisal, additional costs, uh, some additional issues in order to deal with adaptation, but it's basically the large bit of its investment. Second. On disaster relief, what we need is equivalent of something that we have been talking about, know, standing funding, a contingent credit line. I mean, I don't know whether Jose Antonio is back there. Or um, a reserve. You know, we know how to deal with disasters, but the question is that this goes into a much larger scale that we need to find very clearly ways of defining what is an environmental disaster in relation to other types of disasters. But that is a second area. There are mechanisms, and it's a lot of money, but not a huge amount. A third example, research, development, and technology transfer. That is much more precise. We can get the private sector, we can academia involved in it, we can get civil society organizations, we can get public organizations by defining in a very precise way, in, in a way that I suggest in a few minutes because it's going to give me a third round later on. You can take research, development, and technology transfer in critical technologies that developing countries and developed and middle-income countries need in the energy area, in the health area, in agriculture, and then figure out ways of spreading the goods and not having them uh, sort of uh, bounded by intellectual property issues in one way. So all of that can be done. What does it require? First of all, 
a much more rigorous and highly focused approach to define what is an international public good. Public goods have been defined as almost anything. You know, I mean, it has been all over the place in there. We need much more rigorous criteria to do that. Once you define a few of them, you need political decision in order to decide exactly how far down, and this is something that Inge mentioned, there is the global public good actions taken at the international or global level, but finally, in the end, you have to get all the way down to someone that makes a decision to use the card, to turn the light off, to change the light bulb, and so on. Now, do you want to go in the provision of the public good all the way from the top, defining the regime all the way down? No. What you need to do is to define the core component of the international public good. That part that is really international requires collective action, and then leave the complementary funding to go through in an institutional mechanism that allows you to use the nudges, use the incentives, use the carrots, use the sticks gradually in order to involve those who really consume and produce the quote unquote public good. But you need to go all the way from the top to the down. And I will stop that before I use really cut the microphone. I think there are two phenomena here. First, it's late afternoon, so there's a little somnolence and not enough coffee. Uh, and second, the uh, expositions are so clear that they don't require any uh, comment. But let me ask uh, uh, you to consider. I'm going to I'm going to recognize one hook, and uh, and but uh, let me know because otherwise. I'm sure Francisco can uh, productively use the rest of our time. Juan Yuk. The SDRs are not completely free lunch, and I'm not necess I, I don't. I, I don't really agree with uh, issuing SDRs in trillions of dollars amount. But back in 2009, for instance, um, you know, there was a new issuing of SDRs uh, in excess of 200 billion dollars. And yes, it, uh, yes, they have to be converted into one of the year four currencies to be usable. Yes, they have to, and, and then you have to pay, uh, pay interest on it. But I mean, the uh, the interest rate is you know uh, less than one percent, um, and uh, and it it doesn't it doesn't uh, impose a huge burden. And as uh, as Lawrence said, if we are to have a uh, uh, public funding element of the GCF, uh, pledge element, uh, GCF, uh, in addition to all, all kinds of uh, uh, talk about uh, innovative financing and so on, one way to do that would be to use actually SDRs as the reserve capital uh, according to the allocation rules. Um, so that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah, I would like to come back to a point that uh, Francisco just now made about the global public good. Uh, I think we really have to think through this provision path and follow the subsidiarity principle to see what can we do after we have agreed that we have to do something in this issue area, what can we do best do locally, nationally, regionally, and then only f try to figure out certain things that definitely require collective action at the international level. Now, I think the time has come, since we really fa have many global public goods by now, uh, that we think more systematically about our issue in terms of global public policy and not just as an ad hoc arrangement. We can always <laughs> still make ad hoc arrangements, but in a more systematic framework. We are facing these cliffs and we need urgent financing. So there is a, a global exigency that needs to be addressed collectively. In addition, we have uh, uh, made commitments as the international community in HIV AIDS uh, treatment and so on, or we have to take care of the seed banks. So all of this requires long-term reliable uh, financing. And therefore, we have to look for resources that uh, are predictable and reliable and finance these very few things that require these interventions out of urgency uh, considerations or because people uh, are dying. 
And therefore, I think the currency transaction levy would be a more sort of logical approach that one, uh, uh, because it would generate a sort of recurrent stream uh, of resources, and one could use now right away a part for climate change financing, and another part could go to uh, health issues, another part could go to a disaster management facility so that we don't have to scramble around uh, for resources each time we have a disaster. But we could, of course, also augment the pool of resources we have by, by looking into the SDR issue. But let me come to your proposal. I really think, uh, I mean, I would admire CG if they have the courage to go to the oil companies and to the US and take on the struggle with them. But I think you better go home and have a real uh, <laughs> grassroots movement. That too. Yeah, that too. We can nudge from the, uh, from the outside. But uh, we also have to see where we intervene. We will all cry about the behavior of the uh, US. But uh, basically, I think you have to do a lot of homework uh, with, with, uh, in the country so that we are free to focus attention on countries that have less capacity to manage it all or that we can think through the uh, global issues. Uh, you're right. It's mostly a job for Americans to do, but I think that the thing that outsiders can uniquely do is to split the U.S. business coalition through the threat of tariffs. And I think unless we can split that U.S. business coalition, we can, you know, march and get arrested as I have done, and we, it won't change anything. We're going to have to somehow split that coalition. Um, I would also say I took a swipe at the um, uh, preoccupation with finance. There's a whole set of non-financial services which are also global global public goods that we need in a bottom-up world. The um, powers that be have tried to persuade us it's going to be good enough for every country to make its own pledges in terms of reduced emissions and contributions to uh, adaptation, but we have no entity that is certifying what is really a reduced emission. We have nobody that is actually measuring emission levels, nobody to follow up on the pledges, and uh, I think that we're there an argument could be made, and I think this is one that the Obama administration might be very sympathetic to, to create a new international institution, either as the branch of an existing institution like the World Bank or a freestanding one that would uh, provide the, um, the non-financial knowledge-based services that we need in a bottom-up world to facilitate all the transactions that so many of us think are going to be part of the solution. Before I give uh, Francisco the floor for a third uh, volley, uh, I wonder if there's any reaction uh, from the assembled to a couple of suggestions that were made. Uh, first, I was intrigued by the suggestion that the finance community should vacate the G20, <laughs> uh, since they have so many other venues, and, and leave it for something that's really e existentially important. Uh, so I, uh, I invite, uh, yes, Stephen. Table nine. Thank you. Um, at the um, risk of uh, being branded a, uh, a killjoy finance person, uh, let me, let me uh, just raise two very practical problems with the currency transaction tax and with uh, the innovative proposal to, for us to get out of the, um, uh, the G20 space. Um, on the currency transaction tax, I have my my ex bosses used to be very very keen on it, and we could never work out how you get around the um, the collective action problem. Um, there, if there is anything uh, which is subject to um, uh, disintermediation putting a, even a very, very small tax on um, an activity which is quintessentially mobile, um, this is it. And we, we could never find a way of making, the, uh, uh, making it stick without an absolutely universal tax. Um, and that just wasn't going to happen. Maybe the climate will change, but uh, uh, I still think it's a fundamental problem. In terms of the, um, the, the G20 as a forum for discussing these things, um, 
I still have the scars on my back from trying to uh, trying to incorporate uh, some some work on climate finance and on trade when we had the G20 presidency back in 2009. And I was pondering on why, why it was so difficult to get any agreement. Um, and I think there are, there are two things here. One is that um, it's the wrong forum, the wrong people are there. Okay, so get, 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 us out, get the finance people out and bring the right people in is your answer. Um, the problem with that is that um, while the finance guys didn't understand, I'm sure we were very ham-fisted about trying to, trying to uh, move the climate finance agenda forward, um, but nevertheless, um, the guys who did do the negotiation, the environment ministers and so on, um, clearly felt that the, agenda, the, the forums that they had weren't going to work. So, they, so they, the answer was, well, try and, try and find another forum. Um, the finance people didn't have the expertise, uh, but also, there's, I think there's a fundamental problem here, which is that the reason that the finance G20 route works, albeit rather imperfectly, is that ultimately it reports into uh, universal fora where you can actually get things done. So the IMF, for example, uh, because it has a, a voting structure which, um, uh, which allows um, holdout minorities to be basically crammed down, um, you, can, you can end up with a solution. Whenever we tried to get ourselves into this, uh, into this space, um, the problem that we kept being told was, you'll never get this through the UN triple, FCCC because you can't get agreement in that body. So the solution of using a different forum uh, of the G20, the Coalition of the Willing, to, uh, to, to lead it forward, struck me as never, never, likely to, never being likely to work. Um, and there's a fundamental paradox there, which is, you want to use um, uh, an illegitimate, unrepresentative small group of countries because you can't get it through the legitimate body. So anyway, I apologize for sounding very negative on this, but uh, uh, we did try it in the past. It didn't work then. Maybe it'll work next time. Thanks. I've been reminded that if anybody wants to ask a question, they're to press their uh, mic button. Table 12. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I was saving my comments for tomorrow morning when I'm, uh, when I'm to be panel chairman, uh, and part of it was on the G20 uh, and, uh, and what it should and shouldn't be doing. And I must say that um, for months, if not years now, we've been hearing from the financial community that let us get this economic financial crisis resolved, and then you can think about expanding the agenda of the G20. But first of all, we've got to get this fixed. Well, I got to tell you, I've been sitting here now for a day. I don't see that this is going to get fixed in my lifetime. I think that this, this, the, the complexity, the argumentation, the, the, uh, the, the degree of detail, I don't think that it's in the world's interest to wait until you guys solve this problem. I think you should take it away to the IMF and come back someday uh, uh, when you actually know what you're going to be doing about it. It's not that, that we want to get the G20 finance or environment ministers together. The reason we want to get the, the G20 to look at these questions is because the leaders are there. It's the leaders who can make the decisions and who have to make the, the decisions, the cross-cutting decisions, the zero-sum decisions. It's never going to be made by an environment minister, and it's not going to be made by a finance minister either. 
So you, the whole point of the G20 is that you have the authority there. And, f and further, the idea that, you know, and, and I'm sympathetic to the, one, the argument you were making, how do you get this issue sort of act, acted upon if you have to take it to the UNFCC? I happen to be the, the climate change negotiator for Canada at Kyoto. I know a little bit about it. I have a few scars of my own. But, that, but what the significance of the G20 is not that it takes this issue and then imposes it on the UNFCC or offers it to the UNFCC and they do what they want with it, which is to say nothing, probably, uh, or to defeat it however they can. It's that, the, it's that the countries at the G20 who are the principal polluters take action, agree to take action themselves. It doesn't have to have a UNFCC framework. It just, it needs to have people who are committed to doing something, doing something. And the, and the real, I guess, explanation why the G20 is not doing anything on climate change is that it doesn't want to. So uh, one of these days, if the, if the weather gets bad enough, and maybe, maybe uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy following on Katrina, maybe that's enough to get people to take the view that they really have to take some precautionary action. But it doesn't have to be imposed on an unwilling world because the main people who are responsible for the problem are sitting around the G20 table. Thanks. Table nine. Thanks very much, Barry. Just a quick uh, two-hander on, on Paul's intervention. I, I hear what you're saying, and I am very sympathetic to it. Um, but having said that, I think there is just a basic uh, political reality that if you are in a situation, as many countries are, with, with employment below the full employment level, you will be very reluctant to adopt measures, however beneficial in the long run, um, that could potentially result in even higher unemployment. And I think, and I'm not defending this, I'm just saying this is, this is why there is such an emphasis on uh, trying to find a way out of this crisis, out of this morass. And I think part of the reason that people respond in this way is to, um, to, to draw on the, uh, the prospect heuristic of Daniel Kahneman and, and Tversky, the, the, in which individuals, when evaluating potentially favorable outcomes, are risk averse. They'll, they'll, they'll want the sure good thing as opposed to uh, an unsure, even bigger, uh, bigger uh, outcome. But when it comes to looking at bad outcomes, climate change, people are risk preferring. And I think you know, the, the challenge is how do we, how do we get past this, this uh, instinctive response uh, in an environment where unemployment is, is as I say, already um, above where it should be and where people are uh, concerned about the Im impacts of climate change measures in, in exacerbating that, that problem. And, I, and again, I'm not saying, you know, we shouldn't be doing anything. I'm just saying we have to find a way to resolve those basic issues. Yeah, a quick response to the last comment. Uh, green growth is a good business opportunity. And it would generate a lot of new momentum also to uh, create jobs. So um, I'm a little worried that uh, we have this um, sort of attitude that we say, oh, at present, the leaders wouldn't like it and therefore don't even think about it. Now, you encouraged us to think out of the box. And I, uh, I think instead of saying, no, no, given the current uh, constellations, it wouldn't work. Now, let us think through how we can motivate our leaders to actually uh, want these things. And I'm also worried about saying uh, it will never happen, the regulation, the global regulation. It has to happen. We will kid ourselves if we think that in the long run, even business would support us into saying, no, there should be no regulation. Business wants to have a level playing field. They want to have certainty. They want to have predictability. 
and we should try to uh, encourage our leaders to think in terms of global regulation because then many other things uh, would fall into place, I think. Table seven. Thank you, Barry. Um, what I'm going to say will sound a little bit radical. I agree entirely with what uh, Paul Heinbecker said, um, but I also think Jim Haley is right. Um, I, I've been coming in this room to meetings on the G20 for, I mean, God only knows how many years now, I mean, before the G20 existed. And I must say, when I listen to the people in the finance and economic community, this is the gloomiest I have heard. Not only is it going on a long time, Paul, it's getting worse. Um, where does that lead me? It leads me to the belief that the reality is the world is not going to do anything in time about climate change, and we're not talking about adaptation within two degrees. I think that it's only a matter of time, and this is the radical thing, I think it is only a matter of time till something goes very badly wrong and people are very worried and we're into geoengineering. I hate the idea of geoengineering. I don't think there are any magic bullets there. But if we're not, if the world isn't very careful, we're going to get there, uh, that that'll be a, s a subject seriously discussed. So I think that Paul is absolutely right. It's up to leaders to discuss this. Uh, it's the only way it's going to happen. It's not going to happen through environment ministers. That's a joke. Um, it's not going to happen but through finance ministers on their own. I think that's clearly the way we've got to go. And the final thing I would, would add, uh, this came up uh, last night at our, uh, um, in, the, in the discussion afterwards, and that is the, th the thing about leaders, if the leaders forum is functioning well, is they talk to each other. They can talk to each other in an informal way. They're not talking with, what have we got, 100 people in this room, probably less. They're good, they're not, you can't talk with 500 people in the room. So I really do believe the answer to climate change is, and it, it should happen sooner rather than later, is to get leaders involved and do that before we're into the geoengineering non-solutions. Well, we seem, we seem to have awakened from our siesta. I've got two questions from table 12, one from four, and then table eight. So what I'd like to ask is to please uh, make your comment or ask your question in uh, 60 seconds or little, not, not much more. Table 12. Uh, thank you, Barry. Um, I don't think the fact that uh, climate change is not on the agenda of the G20 has anything to do with the finance minister's process. Uh, it is basically because of the political economy of climate change at the level of the leaders themselves. And in particular, it's my constituents that are not uh, really prepared to delegate the issue of climate uh, to the G20. Uh, as you have pointed out, there are really two issues. One is, what are the individual actions that we can take to produce a virtuous cycle? But the second is, what's the burden sharing? Okay. And it's on the second that we are extremely reluctant, and I say we, not me personally, but my stakeholders, extremely re reluctant to enter into a discourse in the G20 because we, it's, it, it seems that that would give a free ride in the UNFCC to commitments that have already been made. That's the political economy. Second from table 12. Um, we bring together leaders of the 20 countries, the most precious time on earth, probably the most pre precious commodity on earth. They're speaking about 16 different languages. We bring them together for about a day and we wonder whether, why it is that we don't get very much done. Uh, if we want to expand the agenda, why don't we have, you know, if we think the finance ministers need to be present, and I would agree with that, why don't we just expand the agenda by a day? And the second point is, uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, it, unless I'm misunderstanding something, we're not, a the G20 doesn't have to ask either permission to discuss this issue, nor, does it, nor is it in a position to impose its decision on anyone else. If it takes action itself, that will take care of 90% of the problem. You don't have to worry so much about the rest. It doesn't matter very much 
what, uh, what uh, Guatemala or, uh, or the Congo is going to do on this issue. The big problems are around the table. Let, you know, discuss it among the people who are creating the problem and let the rest take care of itself. And I don't think that that represents any kind of departure from commitments already made because the commitments already made are, are scarcely being observed anyway. Table four. I'd like to pose a question probably to Sang-Chi Lee. Uh, one of the most successful packages after the uh, crisis was that of Korea, uh, large in a number of respects and very successful in all. But a key part of that, since it involved quite a lot of maintaining of uh, employment levels in places where demand had fallen in export markets, was uh, adopting a green agenda whereby activities were deliberately focused on the building a green Korea. I'd like to know a little more about the history and consequences of that, whether that linkage was subsequently seen as productive or not, and where it's going from there. Dr. Lee, why don't you uh, take a minute to reflect. I'll uh, ask you to respond to the question um, after the comments of tables eight and seven. Table eight. Yeah, I, I haven't heard uh, as many cliffs as I have heard today. There is a fiscal cliff, there is a financial cliff, there is an environmental cliff. It feels like I'm going to fall no matter what. Uh, if I run uh, away from one, I'm going to run into the other one. <laughs> but in any case, I didn't want to sound just uh, negative. Uh, many of the comments, whatever the cliff that we are talking about, people talked about three types of ways out. Uh, I happen to... Uh, but anyway, before I say what I happen, uh, let me say what they are. The first one is what I would call the normative approach to making life better. The world ought to deal with this and that. The world uh, needs to worry about the environment because the children are going to pay for it. The, anyway, there is always this ought to, the good-hearted people. This is one approach to life. Uh, and it sounds good, but I'm not really sure it changed the world. Uh, the second way of thinking about it, the second approach that I've heard was, let's provide the technical solutions. So for instance, if we find the carrot and sticks, or if we integrate the technical solution and investment at the level of adaptation within a country, or basically the range of options that are offered is really the technical solutions. And that also is useful, but I'm not really sure who is going to implement it, who is going to buy it, basically. The third one that I very much ascribe to is the political-driven way of thinking about the world. You can identify all the great solutions, you can make statements about what's good for the world, but if politicians don't buy it, I'm sorry, nothing much is going to happen because they are the guys who decide on doing it. When we can say that, that the G20 uh, can do something or can, we can get them together, but even if you get them together, they are not going to pay attention to it unless they have good reasons. And politicians respond to either pressure, domestic pressure, or some pressure of some kind. Either Mother Nature is going to get mad at us and we are going to deal with it because we are really in big trouble. That is really exogenous. We wait for bad events to take over and force us into doing something about it. That's one possibility. The other one is that there is a homegrown demand for, change, for taking measures against the environment. And that is the one that we understand the least, and that is the one we don't deal with very well, and that is the one we need to devote a lot of attention to, understanding the political economy of why politicians behave the way they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I don't know if these remarks would be good or bad news for those that support the G20 or those that detract from the G20. But I totally agree with Paul when he says that we need to benefit from having the leaders together. It's uh, the G20, one of the, the best uh, things that do, can do at, at some points is breaking global deadlocks. And in this case of uh, climate change, we have all major emitters. In that sense, uh, what I wanted to share with you is that during the Mexi Mexican presidency, we, we included the concept of green growth as, as a cross-cutting issue in the agenda. 
it was not a conceptual discussion, but more practical and uh, solutions. And we included it in areas such as agriculture, energy, infrastructure, employment, and structural reforms, and across both the Sherpa and the finance track. In this sense, the G20 Development Working Group will launch next year a dialogue platform on inclusive green investment to help encourage further exploration of effective mechanisms to mobilize public and private funds for green investment in developing countries. Also, this year, a G20 study group on climate finance was created as a means to provide finance ministers with the necessary information on how to mobilize resources for climate fin finance. I am one, one of those believers that, that think that uh, this group, the CG group, can make contributions to these different working groups of the G20. Thank you. I'm afraid that uh, the power, the prerogatives of the chair are extraordinarily limited. I, I, they flashed this thing on here saying that the finish, the bus is leaving at 5.30. Uh, so what I would like to do, since it seems we have less than uh, 10 minutes in terms of time, is to, giving you some time to get your codes. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give you the one minute uh, takeaway message. You know, you're in, uh, you're in the uh, elevator with, uh, with your country's leader and you've got one minute. Francisco, one minute. I will never be in, a, in that situation with a leader. No, Francisco <laughs> is actually an aspiring politician. He may be uh, the, the leader. No, no, no. Well, anyway, so just coming to the question that, uh, that I had or comment on from Ahmed, I mean, what happens is, yeah, we're in the middle of not only three cliffs or approaching those cliffs, we are in a mess. We are in a change of epoch. We look at it through the G20, we look at it through finance, we look at it through environment, look at it through, you know, look at it in many different ways. By the time you add up, and I don't have to do that, all the changes that are taking place, the world of our children, our children will be very different from the world we are in. And so let's face that. An adaptation to climate change is just one of the many things that we have to worry about, and it's already happened. So it's not like we need to adapt and start thinking. Investments in my own country, in Peru, will have to take into consideration that we're going to have in 10 years water problems, climate change problems, uh, you know, drought, quite a other things. So you, it's already too late, so we need to do it. So the, the thing I would say is, and I don't have time to do it, but I, let me just uh, comment on this. Simply, we try to, to, to develop a way of dealing with these issues. They can be done. There are answers. Not all encompassing, but it is possible to work in a practical way on a few well-defined issues, taking advantage that a lot is already happening. What is going is a lot of things are taking place in a very, very distributed way, and I think that the role of an institution like CG and at the political level, as has been mentioned just a while ago by your Mexican colleague, a lot is happening, a lot can happen, and the G20 can play a role, but it's just more of a information, coordination, in order to make this thing really work. Thank you. Well, well uh, Thierry, uh, Thierry de Montbrial had this idea of the new G7 a couple of years ago. Um, United States, uh, EU, uh, China, Japan, India, Brazil, and Russia would be the new uh, G7. And when I heard about that idea, I tried to call uh, Barry Karen. Andres Rosenthal and Mark Thurwell um, to try and work together to prevent the spread of this crazy idea. <laughs> and the whole point about the G20 as a minilateral forum is that it does not, uh, you know, it does not pretend to be a universal forum. And uh, you, we like to get things done uh, in a eff more effective way than having 193 countries together at the same place. So. We don't have to, at the G20, worry about constituencies. And uh, in fact, countries' policies, individual member countries' policies matter much, uh, much more. So uh, they are, I mean, as, uh, as major players in the world economy, we have rights and responsibilities. And for things like climate change, uh, there's a chance for a breakthrough at the G20 to a much greater degree than at the uh, UNFCCC. Uh, I mean, since 2004, non-Annex 1 countries emit more uh, carbon dioxide than Annex 1 countries. 
and G20 has both the United States on the one hand and China on the other. And, uh, and uh, it, I mean, it could work out a deal and we don't have to be held hostage to uh, countries like Venezuela at the uh, UNFCCC. And, uh, and uh, in some sense, unilateral action on green agenda could be, uh, could be uh, in the national interest as well. Uh, and I'll just close with a brief uh, explanation on Korea's green agenda. I mean, Korea is, a, is, is the world's ninth emitter of carbon dioxide, and it's the, it's the world's uh, seventh exporter of goods and services, right? Uh, we can continue to be defensive on climate change front, or we can become an early mover and try to, uh, try to develop technologies and try to uh, develop global agenda on climate change. And that really formed the background of the green growth agenda in Korea since 2008. Yeah, I want to come back to your intervention. I think that acting on climate change is good economics already now. And that point we should get across. And if we don't have enough studies, we will do uh, more studies. However, we also should take fairness in this context very seriously, because uh, Peru and other <laughs> developing countries are suffering from uh, what we have done altogether in the world uh, to the uh, atmosphere. But fairness has to have two aspects. We have to help you with adaptation as a compensatory measure, and then we have to offer win-win bargains when we meet in international uh, uh, negotiations. And if we do these two things, we will see that even Amas constituency will be prepared to come along much more uh, enthusiastically. But I would not like to end before saying I would strongly recommend that uh, there be a follow-up study that systematically elaborates the SDR idea showing what are the pros, what are the cons before we say we don't like it, we feel it's not right or so. Let's get the real systematic study, compare it to other possible financing arrangements, and then we meet next year again. I'm going to do one minute. Uh, China is moving to implement a provincial level cap and trade. India's feed-in tariffs already have a substantial implicit price for carbon. Brazil is a leader in green growth. Europe has a price on carbon. The main obstacle to action is the world's nearly the largest emitter, certainly the, um, the largest per capita emissions. It's my country, and we are captive. There's been state capture by fossil fuel companies. We have a rare opening to overcome that in the next six or eight months. There's going to be domestic pressure, and I hope the world will become more sophisticated about finding ways to bring pressure to bear on the United States to break free of this captivity that American politics is in at the behest of the big oil and gas companies. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, in the mid-90s, uh, when Gordon and I were trying to push the concept of debt relief, there was one norm that was immovable. It was that uh, all sovereign debt is collectible. All sovereign <laughs> debt is always collectible, and there was no way, you know, people were considered manic if they thought that that rule could change. I'm reminded of a book title that uh, Kishore Mahbubani had, Can Asians Think? I think the answer is yes. Can Asians change rules? Yes, I think so. Can we change the rules? I think so. Thank you very much for your attention.